I'm Luther Kruger with the Big Blue Sun Museum of Solar Cooking, based in our backyard in Minneapolis. I'm here with uh, Kurt Newbeck in Houston, Texas. Hey. Uh, wonderful day today, beautiful sun, and uh, we're inside where it's cooler. <laughs> <laughs> but we're going to talk about solar solar cooking and specifically, but I'm looking forward to hearing an architect's perspective on, on solar cooking. And uh, uh, Kurt's graciously allowed us to camp out for a few hours here on his home to see what we can talk about. So. And only, I always have just three questions, and we can branch off of them. One is, what got you into solar in any way, shape, or form, but specifically solar cooking? Um, where do you see things right now? Uh, for instance, I, you're going to tell me about some designs you have, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. And then how about, do you have any ideas on how to promote it worldwide, mm -hmm. you know, either in places that desperately need it, or even here in the States where it's really kind of more of a pastime? So, so let's start off with how, how did you get okay. into it, and, and I'm sure some of this will... will uh, segue into that too. How yeah. did you get into solar? When I was uh, an architect, architecture student in, uh, in the late 70s and early 80s, I just decided back then I, to go to grad school to study, and it, we called it at the time, so well, solar architecture, energy conscious design. Uh, and, I, and so I, the best program in the country, at least at the time, was at Arizona State, so I went to ASU for get my master's degree and loved it and so just really immersed into that whole uh, solar culture. Of course it was solar architecture and engineering focus but solar cooking when and ovens were part of it. In fact I remember there was a test one day but with the engineering professor and, and the uh, there was an extra credit question that had to do with optimizing a solar oven. <laughs> and so I, I just remember that. Uh, in fact, that's this, this stack of books. This is a stack of books from late 70s and early 80s about all kinds of things that, that I was studying at the time. Most of it, as I said, was like passive solar architecture. We didn't get into photovoltaics. I mean, we, we existed, but it wasn't really what we were studying. And, but solar ovens, I have a couple things flagged in here that were part of that. So it was, um, it was that's that's what got me got me interested. And so it was it was a fun time. Just loved doing it. Really, it, it was such a great time to know that you were immersed in just all the all the people who were doing it. I was studying and and working with and met many of them and spoke at a conference and uh, and all this. Some of those names are still. Uh, big names in, in the world today in, in energy conscious design and such. So that's what got me into it. But then once I graduated and then I was doing you know, traditional architecture, I didn't do much with solar for years. And then, well actually I do have a slide of that. Uh, um, about 10 years ago, uh, my sons are Boy Scouts and, and we were going to do a, a cooking demonstration, which our troop always did cooking at this particular event. Well, there was a burn ban at the time, and and it was an extreme burn, burn ban. Sometimes burn ban, you can't have an open flame, but you can cook on a stove. But sometimes you can't even do that. So my good friend Frank, you can see his hat there, <laughs> he, uh, the, who was the scoutmaster, said, well, let's do solar cooking. He said, let's let's do it anyway. So a bunch of the kids made little solar ovens, you know, as, as you do, kind of science experiment kind of things. And then I did that one, which Frank likes to describe as the... NASA satellite <laughs> dish, <laughs> uh, and 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 it worked. In fact, I have the remnants of it out back. I I, I pulled it out because I haven't done anything with it. Uh, I'm not as much re actually into the cooking. I mean, at that day we cooked, and that's in fact that's my oldest son who was, uh, in, and then he was being interviewed by the local news media because someone had called them to say, hey, we got these Boy Scouts out here cooking, with, and there's a burn ban, and they said, how are you doing that? So the crew came out to say why or how they were doing it so so that was a, it was a fun day and and everybody learned uh, in about solar cooking and and even though it was we were in the woods and it was partly cloudy still we got enough heat to sure. cook up some uh, in, in fact there was some kind of apple compote thing which was great aromatic and oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Loved it, so. uh, and then 
jumping ahead to then just recently, well, six, seven months ago now, I just started thinking about it again. And late at night, I'd wake up and jot down some ideas about it. And, and, and I guess that's about the time that I was uh, learn more about the SCI and the wiki and, and watch all of your videos. I just decided I want to see what's the state of the art. What am I, what else are people doing out there? And, and it hasn't, I mean, there's been a lot done, of course, and a lot of interesting new pro products. And, and it's been great just seeing through, mostly through your videos and other videos too on YouTube and such, uh, the, the names and the faces and the stories behind those those ovens uh, and cookers. I mean, I prefer ovens, but that, I know the variety of their cookers. So, uh, yeah. So that's that's a long answer to how did I oh, get. Oh no, but it's, I think it's I think it's the same for just about everyone I talk to. Mm -hmm. Start off with something, oh, and then ten years later, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> or someone says, hey, I got this new cooker, and oh yeah, I remember that from you know the the Pringle scan cooker or mm -hmm. whatever you know uh, Scouts, and it almost doesn't matter. It, it it generated you know the that spark that's still there you know burning around. So. Yeah. Well, in yeah. fact, on that point, when I was into this, I was also at the time, uh, well, in undergrad, I put myself through school making pizza. So I, even in grad school, I, with a friend, we considered opening a pizza restaurant. So, and so pizza's always been sort of the family food. Sure. So there's, you'll see, there's some, something else about, maybe I should do something with pizza too, solar ovens, pizza. So that's, that's part of also one of those things that was important to me in, the, in my 20s, and now I'm saying, oh, let me do something sure, with that again. Sure. So. Yeah, <laughs> we have. Uh, you maybe have seen Sarah Gelmerson post now and again. Mm -hmm. She's been kind of out of for a little while, but she's getting back into it. Uh, when we were in Portugal at the conference uh, in Faro last, mm -hmm. just before the pandemic, uh, I said we got to come up with a solar cooking challenge, a list of things people think are difficult to cook, no matter what, you know, souffles and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so we came up with about a dozen, and we've been uh, spreading that around, saying, okay, let's just start checking them off, saying, yes, you can cook that with a solar cooker. Mm -hmm. So just remove as much of the fear level of, you know, well, that's my favorite thing, or it's traditional, or it's a cultural thing. I mean, mm -hmm. that's the thing for the last question, of course, promoting it is, a lot of the people I've talked to is, if, if you can't cook their local dish, you might not be able to make inroads, oh, you know, and uh, so uh, so that's one of the first thing you want to try is to uh, get as close to that as possible. But mm -hmm. but anyway, yeah, no, that's important. It's it's how people start. It doesn't matter. It's where it's where you end up. So so cool. So that's uh, this was how long ago? It was about eight years ago. Okay, I think. Yeah. 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 All right. Uh, and then since then, uh, oh, so this next thing I wanted a, getting to your second yeah. question. So this is more. So how does what? When, when you first contacted me about talking, I thought, well, what do I have to share that, I mean, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not selling a, a particular cooker, I don't, as I said, I'm not, I don't even cook that, that often with them, but I have been thinking so much about how to design them, and, and I know a lot, I've studied, I've read, <laughs> it just kind of shows the, the kind of geek I am about this stuff. I, you know, late at night, I'll be on my phone where other people are, I don't know, flipping through videos or something like that. I'm searching for, uh, like master's theses about, <laughs> about sure, optimizing sure. solar cookers sure. to see what did they do and, and what were the calculations that they did to understand uh, yeah, the engineering kind of made it real fundamental. So, because one of the ways architects and engineers work is you know, the design process, there's lots of ways to describe it, but one of them is known as design thinking. And that talked about like, first you empathize. The first step is you empathize, really understand the person you're trying to design for. And, and understand what are their issues, what are they trying to achieve, and then you can develop, you can define the problem and the goals you're trying to achieve, and then, and then you ideate, you come up with a wide range of ideas, and then you narrow those down to the ones that, that you can prototype, and then you test and you learn about those. Um, and then there's some, so that's kind of the design process generally. And then I was also fortunate to have studied and, and used for decades a process known as problem seeking, which is where before you design something, uh, you know, I mentioned a minute ago, like define the problem. Well, how do you do that? So many people just start with, what's the problem? Well, let me design, let me jump into answering it. But they don't have enough emphasis on what's define the problem we're trying to solve. So that's what the problem seeking methodology does. And you first identify what are your goals? Uh, where are you today? Sometimes you can do this the other way. Where are we today? What's the goals? What's the gap? And, and then you can start looking at what are the relevant facts that we need that are gonna shape this, that will drive a, a solution to, to achieve the goal in light of the facts. So what are those concepts or strategies? So you're gonna see that. That's why I wanted to walk through that, because you're gonna see that in, in what we're talking about here. Sure. 
So what are my goals? <laughs> so, so I thought, well, I'll start with, uh, the, the first thing is, again, that user experience. I would like, when I think about in the kitchen, all that, you know, obviously, as, as you said and, and others, that, well, what, what kind of solar cooker do you need? Well, what, how many different kind of cookers do you have in your, in your kitchen? <laughs> you know, we got this little cooker, yeah. uh, which we use for certain kinds of things. We got yeah. the stove, or we're frying some things. We got the big oven. We got the, the toaster. We use the toaster oven a lot. Yeah. And, and it's a big toaster oven, so I, I like to joke to my wife, it's, it's more like an oven toaster. Because yes. <laughs> uh, we use it for everything. And cook small chickens in there. It'll hold a 12-inch pizza. And, 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 we, and we do that a lot. So I thought, I want it to work that easily. You should open it up, put the food in, close it, set the thing, and then it should ding when you're done. You know, it, you want the, the experience to be that comfortable and convenient. And not that it necessarily has to be on a counter. You know, there are people who have come up with those kinds of ideas too. And, uh, but, but how do we get the experience to feel more like that? So that's one of the things that I had in mind. Because uh, the other cookers that I've seen and used, it's not quite that way. Um, so, and then ideally you'd have a temperature control, which we'll talk about that later. Um, but then also I want it to have really even heat distribution because, you know, if it has hot spots, that's, it's just, that's fine for certain kinds of things, but if, if, it, if you're going to put something in, it's got to have even heat distribution. So, uh, and, and then finally, I, I have this idea about keep the user <laughs> out of the machine. In other words, again, it should be you open up, put it in, and then you don't go behind it. You don't go in the machine. So those are, so, so those are the things that are shaping the goals that I would have for solar cooker. And so you can, you probably already did, you're kind of mentally running through, well, yeah, well, that's why that knocks out this yes, category yes. and that knocks out this category. Yeah, there isn't, there aren't that many out there to do this now. Right. So, so that's what got me thinking about this. So, so again, that design process. So what are some of the key facts about solar cooking that are going to influence this? These are all things that you know, and maybe there's one or two that will be interesting to you. But one of the first things is that not everybody understands the sun travels in the plane of the ecliptic. You know, it, it goes, it goes, it starts and it, it goes in a straight line, uh, whether it's in the winter or the, or the equinox or in the summer, it still goes in a straight line. And, you know, I, I see people on the wiki and other places and on social media asking questions about, well, how do you do the tracker? You need the, you know, GIS and, 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 and AI and, you know, it's like, no, it's it's known, and you know the, the, we turn 360 degrees in 24 hours, and so 15 degrees an hour. So I can tell you exactly where the sun is going to be if you tell me where you are <laughs> and which way south. I can tell you exactly where the sun is going to be at any time on any day, uh, and you know, and it, it applies all around the world. And so I think that's a concept. If we understand that, it it can help shape what we're doing. The other thing is that we get. Uh, on, a, on a sunny day in, in the summer, we'll get about 1,000 watts per square meter of power from the sun. Now, admittedly, if, you're, if it's winter or the sun is low or if you're a high latitude, uh, then it's less than something less than that. But knowing that you've got 1,000 watts or maybe it's only 300 sometimes a year, so, but you've got some certain amount of input to work with. Um, and then, of course, converting the heat, you know, the basic things, you've got to know that you got something, you need black if you're going to absorb it, and you need very reflective when you don't want to absorb it. <laughs> so you, you want the two extremes, and it's really what you're working with. Uh, and then the greenhouse effect. So this, um, well, that's what this picture is. I don't know if you've seen this. This is a, a, a video, or a little clip from a video that Dave Oxford put out just recently. Oh, yes, I did see that, uh, yes. And, and it's, I love the story because he shows, I've never seen it demonstrated so well, the greenhouse effect, where because he takes a, a cup of hot coffee or tea or it's not boiling water actually, uh, and he has this thermal imaging camera. Oops, uh, and uh, so he has a thermal imaging camera, and when he puts it behind the clear glass, it's it's opaque, it's yep. invisible yes. to the thermal. And I thought that's such a great demonstration. And he goes on to explain, but that's not true with a turkey bag. Yeah, which is, yeah. Which or is, his is it polycarbonate too, I think. Polycarbonate yeah. also does that, yeah. 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 Um, and so, so anyway, these are fundamental things you can see. These the shapes where we're going next. So, so then, how, where, how do we lose heat? There's four different ways to lose heat. So, conduction, convection, radiation. 
um, everybody remembers from, from grammar school science, but also infiltration is the thing we do with in buildings. That's just air oh, sure. leakage. Yeah. You know? And those of us who have ever lived in cold climates, you understand this, not everybody in the world <laughs> understands the notion of how do you keep the heat in. Uh, and what we do with buildings is you put insulation and you seal up all the cracks. And, and I mean, if you're just outside, <laughs> you put on a coat and you zip it up. And the, the colder it is, the more you're going to do that. And so the same thing applies to how do we keep heat inside a cooker. Again, I'm going to use oven. In my case, everything I talk about, I really want an oven, not a frying pan, um, and not not a surface cooker. So, uh, so, th so there are specific things we can do to make sure we minimize those losses. So a little bit about insulation. So in, in northern Minnesota, the, the, the known as Climate Zone Seven in, yep. in Ashray in the uh, energy world. And, and there, you design in the winter, the design temperature is minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit. And if you want to get to 70 degrees Fahrenheit inside, that's a 90 degrees difference, or delta T as it's called. So 90 degrees delta T. And you probably know in Minnesota, the recommended uh, insulation level in, in your attic is about R40, and in the walls is about R24. So that's depending on the insulation you have. It's you know seven to eleven inches of insulation in the attic. That's for ninety degrees delta T. Now, if we're trying to cook an oven and get to be four hundred, four hundred and seventy degrees, how much insulation do we need for for four hundred degrees delta T? Yeah. Well, it's and I, I could do the math, but it's like several feet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the thing that that tells me is wow. I think, I think we all of us are grossly under-insulating our solar ovens. And, and yet, we also know about this concept about the, the hay box, yeah. whereas if you heat something up and you don't have enough power, we'll put it in this super insulated box and it'll cook by itself with no more inputs for the next couple days if you needed to. So we also understand that, but why they haven't really come together to have a really well-insulated box is one of the things I want to test. Sure, um, sure. You know, I want to build some side by side and do some with sort of conventional two, three, four, degree, four inches of insulation, and then do one with super insulated, sure. and and see if there's a difference and make them identical. And I, mean, I and I, I so like the things that that Stan Wells has been yes. doing with his, and I really want to do something very similar. Build at least two identical boxes, get them to make sure they're performing at the same, and then start changing one variable at a exactly. time. You know, double or triple the insulation. And see what does it do to the temperature, yeah. or or just the curve? Does it reach temperature sooner? Well, does it does it hold temperature when the when the clouds go by? I'm sure the answer to those both of those is yes. Yeah. I think we're just going to get better performance if we add more insulation than sure. historically we have. Uh, so, so now here's a question for you: If I, if I gave you a garden hose <laughs> and a colander and said, okay, Luther, how are you going to Keep that full. You put it in a in a pot that's the same size. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, yeah. So there's a couple of strategies you yeah. have. You know, you can you can somehow figure out how to how to get more hoses. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> or yeah, and or oh, and or how do I seal up some of those holes? And so the, I mean, so that's you, you got to maximize the gains and reduce the losses. So and to me, that's the same answer as people who say, you know, this cooker doesn't work at this latitude. Again, I'm sure, I'm sure that's true, but that doesn't mean it, you can't do it. Right. We, we just have to find ways to maximize the gains and reduce the losses. So how do we do that? Well, maximizing the gains is, you point, first of all, point the glass at the sun. Again, like, like Stan's trackers, oh, I mean, he didn't invent tracking, but this is one that, uh, you know, has been, um, I enjoy Stan's stories and posts a lot. But, because, I mean, here's a little diagram of, of, a, of a cooker, a little one square foot cube. If you aim it at the sun, let's say you get 100%, let's say it's one square foot, you get one square foot of sun. If you leave it up, upright, depending on the angle of the sun, you might only get 70% of that going in there. And just because you're not tilting it, because you're not tracking it. So going from 70 to 100, that's a big, that's a big gain. Uh, and then the other thing, of course, if you put some reflectors on it, and you can get it to be three and a half times that much, 
So that's that maximized, you know, that gives you more garden hoses. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can get a lot more going in there, even if the losses are the same. But then minimizing losses, seal up, seal up the gaps. Again, people uh, often, when they make simple, bo simple box ovens, especially if they're opening and closing the glass, they don't always get a really good seal around there, but you're losing heat there. And insulation we talked about. And then double, triple glazing, because if you, especially if you add more insulation, uh, if you do if you do thermal Im imaging, you're going to see all the losses that come through the glass. So that means you want to do more glazing to ins essentially add insulation there. Um, and then there's something else, and that's this diagram. And here's the next one shows you kind of zooms in on it. If this is the glass and the sun coming in is is at some angle, some of it is reflected, some of it transmitted, and some of it in, in fact is radiated or absorbed, heats up the glass. Um, but what we're interested in is how do we make sure we're optimizing the amount transmitted and reduced the amount that's reflected. Well, there's, there's a curve here, and what this says is, as you go from the what's called the incident angle, that means perpendicular, coming straight in, you're, as long as you're close to being straight in, then you're going to get almost all of it is going to go through the glass. But as you start, as the angle of the sun gets shallower, it's going to reflect more. And we all know that. When you hold a device, you can tilt it enough, you, get, you start seeing reflections. So it's, it's an obvious thing. But particularly when you're locating the uh, reflector, you have to really be aware of how much of that is going to, you're just bouncing off. Because if you can add, you might add hundreds of square feet of reflectors, but if all the light's just bouncing off, it's not being helpful. So that's why this is a phenomenon that's really helpful. And this is one of the things that drives what you're going to see in a couple minutes. And you see it starts to drop off. And when you get about, above 50 degrees is where it starts to drop off. And definitely above 60, you start really losing, you start reflecting a lot more. So and again, that's 50 or 60 degrees off of, off of perpendicular. Uh, there's a lot of angles here, so it's you got to make sure we keep track of the, what, that's the incident angle, the perpendicular. So I did some studies here just to show people. Let's let's assume this piece of glass across the bottom here. If the sun's coming in straight, this is the sun. The sun is here. That's perpendicular. It goes right in. If you were to angle it, um, or put it another way, if you put a reflector here, if you tilt this reflector at a certain angle, then what does it do? Hit the glass. And so this essentially looks at if you want to keep this to 50 or less, <laughs> then what's the slope of the reflector have to be? And so the answer is you hear a lot of people say, well, just set it at 60 degrees. Well, it turns out, yeah, that's the bare minimum. That's right as you got the as you sure. have those losses. 60 is helpful, is is convenient because if you're using if, if you have a lit, well, in fact, let's see. <laughs> so I built some little models. Sure. So there's a little pot in there. In fact, so much of what I'm doing here is is based on, you'll recognize this oh, sure. from the Haynes. Roger. Haynes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and I just thought, you know, everything I'm saying is like, that's really brilliant. There's, there's so many great things because, remember, we just talked about it. You got the, the you got the greenhouse effect here, so the, it goes through there. It's black, it, but it, it doesn't uh, it, but it doesn't let the heat through. So it's already adding, you know, like an inner layer <laughs> sure. uh, to and because of the size of it, this is about ten and a half inches, almost eleven. So what I'm planning to do in these things is, is if you put it on some kind of a of a tilting mechanism, we'll talk about more of that in a minute, then a lot of what I'm doing is really designing for a, a sphere, because depending on how you tilt it, there's a, essentially a sphere there. And then the other thing I've been designing for is uh, just what can I get of material. So this is the, the lowest cost tempered glass I've found anywhere. This is a cutting board sure. off of Amazon, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it's tempered, and so uh, that and then I also got some some super clear low iron glass. You know how most glass is slightly green. Sure. This is this is not as as glass goes. It's a low iron, so it it's gets a slightly more light through it than conventional even glass. I mean, just a it's mi very minor. But since I can get my hands on on some twelve by twelves, I did that. So sure. uh, so back to. And you can see, the, if you've got a lid, these are great because it's you know covers the box, and you know so many box cookers out there, you close it up. It's a little briefcase, but but you can set this up, and you can even see 
if if you look, if I tilt this toward you and you can see one one square foot of this, yes. but if I do this and get it to the right angle until you see the whole thing again, yeah. uh, and and so it turns out that's only about fifty percent of that, but still again at sixty degrees you're adding about fifty percent for sure. one reflector. Sure. So that's and and why fifty just because of the way when once you get the angles it adds this is fifty percent sure. of why is the only thing. And if you have four reflectors you double because it's fifty, 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 fifty. That's right. Okay. Yeah. That's right. And then as as you slope it more, if you want to take most advantage of it, or if you make them steeper, they you probably want to get them longer. Now you could keep it to like one foot long, right. but then you're only going to be reflecting like oops, like two thirds of the uh, 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 onto about two thirds of glass, so you can afford to make the reflector longer. So that's why you see certain reflectors where they're longer. And and you know I didn't invent this a lot. If you study all like a lot of reflectors and a lot of solar ovens that use reflectors, the whether it's the Parvati or the uh, like, Sam Irwin clearly understood this. <laughs> you know, uh, there are this just this shapes a lot of things. So based on all that, well, what is that lead you to? So I, like I said, I started with those materials, and then if I think about uh, this box, when I, my little box, uh, and then if you insulate it, well, then maybe instead of just a single reflector, well, maybe there's a like a, a better reflector there. Sure. So, so that's uh, as you said, this this adds about um, well, I'll show that in a second. This adds about uh, well, let me get, I'll, I'll get to that. Sure. But then. I started studying. Well, what are, what are some other shapes that also might work? And this one, on okay. You know, it it is not intuitive at all. Like, why would you come up with this? Well, I'll show you why. I, I model these in the computer, and if you look down the barrel from the sun's view, this is what you see about those three. So there's the one, 60 degrees. It adds, as as you said, three and a half. It's three and a half square feet total, including sure. the, the one square foot. So, you, uh, just, like you said, it adds about two and a half times. Um, this one, look at what these little things, you get the entire uh, wow. ball. And uh, no, again, I used a red ball here because the idea of when this thing is gimbaled as it's rotating, it's, I need to think of it as a sphere. Uh, and I want to be able to see the sphere sure. no matter what the rotation is. And so you can see that whole sphere, when, what these little spikes up here. Um, and then I did another one that's uh, steeper, 70 degrees. It's about as tall, and you see it's about the same amount of square feet. So presumably, again, it, it, at x watts per square meter, <laughs> whether it's 1,000 or 500 if, if it's uh, based on the weather, you're still going to be getting five and a quarter times with the same box. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, so really understanding how to how to make a really effective reflector is 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 one of the uh, big part of the the sort of aha. Uh -huh. So this is just a vari variations on what people do with box ovens. Sure. But this next idea is one that I haven't seen yet, and and the driver. Oh, by, by the way, I mentioned gimbal. I mentioned the word gimbal before. That's this idea. If you like a couple of rings that sure. are tilt, like a, it's like a hammock in a, with a hammock. So the sailor is always. Yeah, right. Or like they're all to the earth. Or people like um, astronauts. Yeah, they put them in these six degrees of freedom chair and like spin them. All those kinds of things. Yeah, same yeah. idea. But you won't need as many. I, I think I just need two rings. Um, but in fact, that's one of the things I, I've got. Well, anyway, that's a little sure. more detail. I, I've started building some of those now. So where does this go? So I get to thinking. Well, what if if you do this and you put it on a tracker? You put insulation, double glazed it, gimbaled it, it's going to be incredibly effective in almost any climate. <laughs> uh, it's going to, because again, you've got three and a half times as much, and it, if you can optimize the inputs and then reduce the losses, it's going to get super hot in there. Now, but then I thought, but you still have to do tracker. And, you know, I talked about how with the plane of the ecliptic, it, it's not, you don't really need a tracker. So, is there a way, could you design an oven like this that was always looking at the sun? So I came up with this idea. So it's really the same, same box, sure. <laughs> basically, but with three pieces of glass. And these are at, it looks almost like a hexagon, 
but again, it was driven by all the math and the geometry we were talking about. These are at 50 degree angles to each other. And so you could just set it and forget it. You say, you look up, point it south, and then depending on your, your altitude, you tilt it, get it to the right tilt for that day, and leave it. And for the next 10 hours, it's going to be in the sun. And, and then if you wanted to then put some reflectors on it, uh, so this is what I'm calling the, the, the Newbeck one. <laughs> okay, sure. I, I've never seen anything like that. I think yes, this is a no, unique idea. Um, so, probably. Have you seen anything like that? No. <laughs> have you ever seen anything like this? No. No. I'm, I'm going to go back to this though, but keep going. Okay. Uh, so, so that's, and, and with all of these, I, I'm, I'm assuming that I would, I want, again, I want people, I don't want people in the machine, so I want this, this will be, you set this sure. once, you tilt it, and then if you if you want to check it out, they have some windows or something. But um, but then when you want to pull it out, then I actually have an idea to. You don't even have to change the tilt. You'll open this up, and it'll be on drawer slides, and because it's all gimbaled, and and that's the other thing that it keeps all the heat inside there. You drop the drop the pot out. Sure. You don't lose any heat in there, or you may you may open it up so you could lose some, but the. I was talking to my wife, and she said, maybe there's some way, like a revolving door, that when you open this, that another flap comes up and closes it. I said, well, so maybe I'll work that in, too, somehow, <laughs> uh, to keep the heat, so you're not losing any heat. So, so I really like this, um, and, and I think that's got, I don't know, it, it's probably over-engineered, and it's going to solve a problem nobody has, but, but I still like, the, again, all that logic, all that uh, geometry we saw sure. would lead you to this. Um, and and it, again, you just set, you aim it, and you leave it, in, and it'll be in the sun for the next ten hours. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, and back to this one briefly, yeah, because yeah. as soon as I saw this, I thought Samer one. You mentioned Samer one, genius. And I do have in my bag. I bring it out later if need be to do a little testing of the, just a laser pointer, mm -hmm. where you can, where as long as you're doing this at well, you like to see the sun, you can, you can do the test. That's what he did to design the Solar Chef. Mm -hmm. Then he came up with the star flower, mm -hmm. and which is basically it's the same thing, but a little larger reflectors, maybe a little larger box with a with the dome bowl rather than the octagonal mm -hmm. pyramid. And then uh, Janie McNutt, who I've interviewed, right. you probably see her oh, yeah. where sense. she talks about his power pedals. Yep. Well, these are the power pedals. Uh -huh. They're just they're not as big, but they but they take care of that one little extra. And he hasn't he hasn't tipped in his, just a smidge. His are tilted. Yeah. 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 So anyway. Uh, but I like this because it might discourage bears. You know, <laughs> the point, the point is just <laughs> a little well, goth. <laughs> and the other thing you have to that I recognize, but but it, it's okay with me that this doesn't work if you're if you assume the solar oven you have to be able to open the glass and so because right. uh, not only is it too far away, but it's but so but again I don't want people in the machine no, getting no, blinded no. and all that stuff and touch don't touch the glass sure. seal up the glass <laughs> yes. so we uh, go fix that infiltration and get a door over here with really good seals mm -hmm. uh, so yeah so that's and then I really have one more and then I'll have a couple other kind of where where might this go sure. and and it's interesting you mentioned about um, Sam Rowan because they uh, he clearly was driven by all his geometries too, because one of the things that both of these do, these assume that if you're working with a one piece of glass you're shining into, and this really does the same thing three times, um, but what if you weren't limited by that? What if you did something else? So that's where I came up with this idea of a solar, of a, of a glass cube. And if you started with a glass cube, Now, this this 60 degree angle thing doesn't apply. That's not a limitation now. So now you can do, I remember when you interviewed uh, Tom Spahn, somebody asked him, like, what angle should the reflectors be? And he said, well, I don't know, 45? Right, right, he was talking to the United Nations about setting up the, the, uh, the Kyoto cooker. And then he gets off the phone and he goes, no, wait. <laughs> yeah, because the 45 would, would put, would, that's what this is. Forty-five yeah. would go perpendicular, and yeah. then and it would go here and go across and shoot right What's back out. It wouldn't would yeah. do anything unless you put the cube right in the middle uh. of that. And and so now this thing just just with a one foot high um, reflector 
has, uh, oh we've gotten, uh, now we've got about nine times as much. Now, we got a lot of losses here, so this thing's going to have to be at least double glazed. Yeah. Um, and, but still, that, so that's going to get a lot. But then if you really wanted to do something, then you do this, and you add another three feet of reflectors. And we're still talking gimbaling the whole thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and right, so you want to keep it angled to the sun, and then, so right, I got to find a balance. I got to find where's the center of gravity here, so that it, it'll pivot around there. Um, and and then, and, and frankly, the, this is only three feet long, so it's not huge. I mean, maybe as reflectors go, it's kind of big. But you know, trying to decide how rigid do I want that to be. You know, if you're in windy conditions, if I take this to the beach, oh, I don't know, maybe it's going to have to be wooden frame and really rigid, and then it's not as portable as. As a simplicity or something like that, yeah. <laughs> uh, but but the amazing thing about this is, and, and, and you know I, I know you can't see it, but but to get a sense of what's in there, so I, I did this on the computer model, and again when you look down from the sun, you see about 23 of those spheres. So in other words, it, and it's the, it's 22 square feet of of surface area of sun facing area. Sure. So you got 22 times as much power going into that box than this little box. Sure. <laughs> uh, so, so that's how, again, the geometry kind of plays into where could this go. Now, where does this go? Uh, I, I recognize some of the limitations of this thing are going to be that, well, I think that, so I started building this. Uh, I told you, so this is the, that, tempered glass, that, that, um, those cutting boards, and then I got high temperature PVC, uh, I mean not PVC, but uh, silicone, high temperature silicone, uh, and then I've got some uh, aluminum frames and we're putting on that, and then I'll double glaze it with, uh, actually I'm going to use that, that super clear glass, which is not tempered, but I could, by the time I'm outside, Sam, I'm afraid that inside here, if this, is, if this gets, I mean let's pick it up at five, six hundred degrees, then then, well, this will probably stop. I, don't, I think this is rated more than that. But a lot of conventional uh, insulations and materials are not rated. You know, like you've talked about polyiso, right. good, uh, good, in, really good insulator, but only up to, I forget what, 300 degrees or something like that. Then it starts to melt. <laughs> so I've had to be really selective about what are the materials that I can get that can handle that kind of heat. So, so I'll double glaze this. And, but I recognize it's still the, the thermal expansion of that thing is going to be the weakest link. That depending, if I don't anchor this really well and where, it's, where it has some room to expand, sure. it'll crack. Yeah. So, uh, so I'm a little worried about that. But I'm, I assume it's going to get, so if you get 22 suns on there, it's going to get yeah. sizzling quickly. Um, the other thing that was my original idea, you know, back to that, that toaster oven. I, I, I seriously looked at, for a long time actually, was searching for an old toaster oven to try to find a broken one. And I'll just start with that. So I have the door and I have the trays and I have the box and I'll just take everything out, like outside the box and build a re big reflector around it. And, and, and essentially put it inside a glass cube. Sure. The spray paint black and there you go. And it should get plenty hot in there. And, and put a little fan in there so it's a convection. Um, so, that's probably what I'll do next here, but I think if you put a black, black cube inside of this, um, it's going to be ventilated. I'm probably going to have to do some kind of sort of high-tech um, uh, energy, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Thermal transfer stuff is a word for that. Um, like these are computer chips, what do you call those little oh, yeah, heat sinks? Sink. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, like build it like a heat sink so, it's, so it constantly is transferring that. But with a fan in there, I think you could keep it inside there, four or five hundred degrees, so easily. Um, and then you'd get to, if I could get it way hotter than you need, then you could actually get a thermostat on there. And, and I'm thinking, put something like big, this is crude, but big metal sure. louver, sure. that's aluminum louver, big ones though, so that they're open most of the time and the sun goes right straight through. But then once it heats, reaches temperature, you close it down partially, or maybe they close down completely uh, until you need sun again. And again, this thing's going to be heavy. It's big, and it's you know you're not going to. And and this thing alone commercially is like a thousand dollars. So <laughs> that's what like for greenhouses. 
where it's yeah. set, like uh, Stan uh -huh. Wells is, uh, where he's got the box with his his uh, inverter and everything in there. He doesn't want the batteries to overheat, and he's mm -hmm. got the basically just the greenhouse uh, piston thing with wax. Yep. And so when it gets hot enough, it lifts it, and all it needs is an inch or two to let out all he needs. And uh, he was worried that it wouldn't be strong enough because he had a really heavy duty uh, box. It, no problem at all. Mm. I mean, the thermal, the uh, hydrodynamics of the wax takes care of it. Mm. So, uh, but yeah, I looked at those too for uh, for ideas I've had, but are way outside my my wheelhouse. So, <laughs> but but I'm but I'm thinking that just the piston idea has to has to apply somewhere. And this is this is a an excellent way to apply it. Mm. You're talking about you're you're generating too much heat. Uh, it's that's exactly what those are made for. So that's great. Yeah. yeah. So so that's basically the goal of if you could in order to be able to set the thermostat, you need to make sure this is this part the input is so overpowered that you can then either dampen the input, you know, kink the sure. hose when you need it, <laughs> sure, sure. or or as you said, open it up somewhere to let some of the heat out. Yeah. So, yeah. So that's about it. Um, the one other thing. Oh. <laughs> I, I also, we get back to the pizza thing. Sure. Pete, people who really like pizza and make, there's, there's pizza oven enthusiasts and they're these big masonry domes, yeah. you probably all see them. We have them. a neighbor that did pizzas for our National Night Out Party. Yeah, and it's the back there, it's the old, what I think of as the old fashioned pizza grill, mm -hmm. you know, pizza bar, or barbecue grill with the, with the bricks and everything. Yeah, that so was wonderful, but. And, and they, <laughs> but they, those people will like build a fire in there and they gotta get the right, uh, kind of wood so it gets super hot in there they get yeah. it to like 900 degrees and then they cook pizza in there because they say like 600 900 is ideal yeah. for a pizza but then they'll cook other things for a couple days while the thing is cooling down sure, sure. Um, so so that would be a good challenge to figure out you, you just need again you need enough reflectors or yeah. Fresnel lenses and stuff and and I'm picturing shine it probably up from the top or bottom, I don't know but some combination of of just heating up all that masonry uh, when you can, and then you have to have some kind of a tracker reflector to make sure it's always shining in there. But then, yeah, after a certain number of hours, it, I don't know why it couldn't work. Well, and that was one of the newest items on our challenge list, Neapolitan pizza. Mm -hmm. Jerry Elmer says, has anyone done that? And people have made pizzas, but it's like, I'm fine with a pizza that doesn't, it doesn't have to be 600. It's, right. if, the, if the crust is baked, I'm fine. But it doesn't, it's not a Neapolitan pizza, you know, I mean, so uh, you you are now the number one contender for building something <laughs> that will take care of the Neapolitan pizza on the challenge. <laughs> yeah, because, well, it, it was some little footnote that went past quickly, but, you know, that the idea of getting getting hot enough to get the Maillard reaction and the yeah. browning and the real, you know, that's where the, so much of the flavor of the yeah. food comes from that. Now I want to make sure that the, whatever I make can get up to that temperature if you want it. Sure, sure. So there you have it. That's, oh. I think that's it. Oh, that's yep. excellent. That's it. I mean, that's exactly what I was looking for because yep. uh, there's a. Uh, I looked at everyone I did last fall. Very few are coming at it from a discipline, mm -hmm. uh, is what I'm thinking of, and uh, and I and I know every perspective uh, just brings it to a better conclusion. And having the having the science behind it also is a good thing for folks like SCI, where they're trying to sell it to people to say yes. Not only does it work. There's principles behind it, and you can train people to do it. Like Mary and uh, Jennifer, we're going to be visiting them in Ohio. Mm -hmm. They're putting together a curriculum on uh, physics, uh, specifically focused on solar cooking things. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, the more of that that's out there and accessible, that's the main thing. So, and, so that's beautiful. You know, one of the things that I, I should have said too that I want to mention the goals, that uh, like I I think that so many people you interviewed and the and the like the panel cookers that are out there between. Uh, uh, Sharon's, the, the Copenhagen, and yeah. the Haynes, and the, you know, and the, um, I watched, uh, what was the other one, the, all, all, not all of them. Um, oh, uh, Jim LaJoy, all yeah. season, all season. Yeah, right, the, yeah. all season. You know, yeah. those are, those are clearly so well thought out, I was like, I don't need to reinvent that. <laughs> I mean, those are already great. I don't, so, and, and that's just not a goal that I have is to, so, but don't, but I want to give credit, but I think those are wonderful yeah. solutions, and, and also, the, you know, the 12 inch solar oven, well, that knocks out uh, evacuated tube right. un until we get big enough tubes. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> and, and that's, uh, you know, to a degree, that's what this is doing. It's kind of a sure. square evacuated tube. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask about that because I think someone posted a question recently, but if you could get a flat, flat pieces of glass where it basically would be a thermal pane where it would be totally evacuated, 
or uh, storm windows or the, the thermal windows mm -hmm. you can get for the house where it's got the uh, xenon or whatever right. some gas you right. know right. I mean, such, is, yeah, yeah I mean and but and then they're talking price after that if yeah. you gotta be able to put that together well plus those things are not because I looked I researched those too and they're, they're just not made to be that kind of temperature right because uh, if you study oven the way ovens are made they, they do have a separate inner glass and outer glass but they're uh, but they're separate pieces of glass sure. and the inner one uh, the gl glass company told me that the oven companies have, I forget the word he used exactly, but something like they, they own the market for that glass, like regular glass companies can't sell it. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so there's another opportunity, I think, to, for people to harvest or, or recycle or upcycle glass from, sure. uh, from oven doors mm -hmm. that we could be reusing wow, in places yeah. where you can't get I mean, it. It's, uh, it's the, the condition we call solaritis, where everything you look at, how can I turn that into uh -huh. a solar cooker? But stuff that already was cooking, well, why not? Yeah. Um, well, <laughs> people are using those uh, washing machine mm -hmm. glass, kind of semi-bowl uh -huh. things, because they're tough. Um, but I don't know that anyone's actually said, oh, I got this Amana range door, and I'm going to use it. But they should. <laughs> well, and that's why I brought this, too, because I do think, you know, I mentioned, well, what happens if you don't limit yourself to just one piece of glass? Sure. And, and I actually thought early on about, well, because based on the sketches and the, in the, in the uh, you know, where the rays were going and things like that, I, too, thought, well, why don't I just basically make this more like a, what's known as a bell jar or, you mm -hmm. know, sphere on, or hemisphere on top, but straight sides, because all this would work, but then other angles would... Well, turns out, yeah, you can get those made out of Pyrex, but they're also $1,100. So that's why I said, well, I don't want to go that route. So the next one, the next route is, this is a conventional Pyrex. This is the biggest piece of Pyrex I could find. But I could see this and then maybe another acrylic dome on top of this. Sure. And I think that's another variation that of, I would start with, a, like comparing it to another box cooker. Just do that and sure. see what does that do. Yeah. Because uh, it would reduce the volume of the box if you lift up the bottom. Because that's another thing we didn't talk much about. I'm assuming that these are all, I've, I've always drawn these one, one cubic foot, both because I'm dealing with one, one foot glass, but I, like I have some 16 inch glass out in the garage too that I also uh, got, but there's the whole surface area losses. Mm -hmm. And if you don't need it for the sun to get in there, then you're just, at, adding more place more holes in the in the colander <laughs> yes. yeah. so so that's why i've been now the, the practicality is you know for, for me i can get a hanes pot i can get a 12 inch pizza so far that's good now you can't cook for a family of four and you know a bunch of different things like mm -hmm. people do but but that's okay right now I'm, it's more of a proof of concept to yes. see does you know does geometry work and test out the, the engineering and the physics and and the practicality of you know building something like this yeah. So, well, the practicality question always comes into play, as in uh, Sharon Claussen comes up with the brilliant just four squares, you crimp them into where they're pretty much a parabolic. Mm -hmm. And although she has a trademark or even, I don't know if she's got a patent, but she's, she's got it registered somehow, but she still wants it open source because she wants people to get it. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, and is this something you're not after setting up shop to manufacture these and so forth? Like uh, Scott right. Rundle said in his, if you remember, how do you mm -hmm. make a million dollars making solar cookers? Start with two million. <laughs> so, but uh, so the yeah, so like a, a polycarbonate bowl outside of the, the Pyrex mm -hmm. bowl, you'd have you'd have effectively that that range set of two pieces yes. of glass. Yeah. Wow. And again, you you know, yeah. think in Minnesota, you know that when it's cold outside and you're trying to keep the heat in, you can. You get losses around the windows. You can feel the cold air yep. blown in. Yep. So that's that's why you got to seal these up. But then you can still feel it through the glass, or a ther like yep. the thermal imaging camera. It, the glass is going to be the bottleneck to next. So at two or maybe even three. Now, admittedly, every time you go through one of these, you get a little bit of loss sure. from the glass. But again, if you got enough reflectors, that's that's not going to be the yep. problem. And the, you know, so many people have reported, oh, I studied that, and it's not like. Insulation is not important, or it should be black, or just, but I'm I'm sure that's for the test they did in those conditions for that kind of panel cooker or whatever. That probably is right, right. but that doesn't necessarily mean it translates to something that's higher insulation mm -hmm. or different uh, different uh, basic fundamental design. Sure. Oh, the other pieces I brought here come. So I've got you know 
I, I think I mentioned Stan Wells once already, but I, you know, he and I have become kind of friends, just emailing, talking about sure, it. He's like, oh, sure. let me see. Sure. So I, and then I, so I bought all the stuff, and, that, and then he's changed his design three times. <laughs> yeah. the tracking, as you saw, yeah. I, the tracking is, if you really want to get higher input, tracking is essential. Yeah. And it's so simple. Well, maybe simple is overstated, but it's it's brilliant. It's elegant that you can do it without batteries, without any other yeah. external power. Yeah. Uh, so. yeah, yeah, that's what he was shooting for. Uh, when the, that one that I built is that was just a very quick. I think I built it in a day. I, the sure. size, it's it's the inside of it. You can't tell from this picture, but it's shaped kind of like a drum. So I, I got mm -hmm. some uh, aluminum, uh, just the big pans that are the water heater collector pans, well, sure. put in. Mm -hmm. so got two of those for the ends and just got some sheet metal to make the sides of the sure. drum and just, uh, I don't know what I did, probably, um, you know, how I fixed them together and then cut cut one side out for this flat spot and, and put a couple of layers of, of acrylic with, you know, just some kind of plastic, plastic with a little um, so a strip of wood in between here to hold them apart, and then the reflectors are just cardboard with aluminum foil sprayed on it down sure. So, you know, I, I have them in kind of a heap now. They did, it's not the most durable long term, but, you know, it was very effective yeah. that day. Yeah. Well, great. Oh, and then I wrapped the whole thing with insulation from a water heater, too. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. Well, so that's kind of the middle ground. Now, the third question always is, you know, the future. The where, where, where are we going from here? Uh, obviously, we can build in some of this stuff, test some more of this, but uh, for countries where they're deforesting still at a rapid clip, uh, or they're burn they're burning it to make make uh, ranch country in Brazil, for instance, you know, mm -hmm. just just not at all thinking in the future. But what are your thoughts on that? How to promote it overseas? How to get more people involved here? Any thoughts on that? Well. I know there are a lot of people working on that, so um, the, particularly the global, I, I agree with you on the global uh, aspect of it. One of the things that architects generally are doing, there's there's a architecture that's been around now for a while already, the 2030 challenges. How do we reduce the amount of greenhouse gases and carbon footprint that buildings are causing? Sure. Uh, and because just the construction of them and the operation both, uh, it just adds a, a big percentage uh, to the global carbon footprint. So, um, so we are, architects are doing things and manufacturers are changing the mix of things and so uh, architects are generally aware of this. One of the things that, that I, I'm doing there is a big annual sandcastle competition here in Galveston yes. every year in August and so this year instead of being on Carver I talked to the organizers and said hey why don't we do some kind of solar cooker demo and they love the idea and so yeah it was just about, they said bottom line is great. You know, what, what do you need? We'll get some sure. volunteers, right. and uh, and one of the guys called me up. He said he's got an all American Sun oven, and so I said, perfect. Let's. You know, let's and and I told you that I, I bought a Simplicity recently, yes. and so I'll, I'll pull that out and, and a Haynes, and um, you know, I don't know if I'll have this one built yet, but maybe I'll build have one of these built before then, and mm -hmm. and just and, and then probably you know bring some some super simple ones too, just just to sure. get uh, try to raise awareness among. Uh, among architects about because there are more things that we can be doing both just individually right. and I mean it's not you know it doesn't solve the global uh, issue or doesn't solve anything on the other side of the world but it's something we can do to start spreading and spreading the awareness that yeah it's it's so it's such an obvious simple solution you know you mentioned the um, Oh, you, you, you pointed me to something on the wiki about um, like in-ground or something yeah, like that. Yeah. And, and I was thinking that this idea, I could basically do dig this into the sand. Why not? <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. And, and whether it's a trough like this, or I, I probably wouldn't do these. But when I first came up with this idea, it was going to be just one continuous reflector. But then I got to thinking, well... You know, a lot of these these rays are just going to be reflecting off, like right. we talked about. You're just going to lose a lot of that. So, um, but anyway, my point is that this there could be some variation of this where we dig a mm -hmm. trough. But the idea to figure out the plane of the ecliptic and make sure the yes. trough is pointed at the right in the right direction, yeah. and it should be good all day. <laughs> when those those ones that are built into the ground, a lot of them are near the equator, so they just literally just build a bowl, you know, build oh, yeah. a bowl, pretty much the same dimensions. But theoretically, you could find like a, a hill and, and build it in so it's more along that plane, you know. 
and uh, with with the sand, you might need I don't know get some get some uh, corrugated uh, roofing or something mm -hmm. to, to hold the sand back so <laughs> you can build you know dig a little trough in there mm -hmm. or something. I don't know. That sounds like a lot of fun. Well, this is fantastic. This is exactly what I, I, I'm just imagine was imagining this to be. Uh, it's going to be a great boost to the folks on the World Network. That's where I post them all. So we get the you know it's almost it's over six thousand people now oh, on nice. international. Um, and the Console of Foods, they've been talking about the conference maybe having to go virtual in 2022, but now things are a little more optimistic. Maybe they'll be able to meet again in person in Faro. So this is the kind of stuff that they'll want to see, you know, uh, the, the, in the process. I mean, this would be a full presentation for them, I believe. So, yeah, well, thank you.